Hi, uh, good evening. Um, for anyone who doesn't know me, my name is Betsy Harding, and I'm a Bronxville resident, and I've agreed to moderate the meeting tonight. Uh, I've lived in Bronxville for more than 30 years, and like many of you, I've watched the flooding at the school in the lower part of the village year after year. And all this time, I really had never wondered about where all that water is coming from. You know, it seemed kind of obvious. Rain, the Bronx River banking up, and then water from uh, the ground at low-lying locations. But, you know, I didn't really think further. And I also hadn't thought about the quality of the water that seems to keep appearing. So I was concerned about damage to property, like computers in the school basement and that sort of thing. And I was also you know, I'd be worried about the danger of mold from all the moisture, but I didn't think about any other health risks that might be coming from the water. That all changed, changed in January when, by chance, I met Rachel Zolotev, who's right over here. Rachel alerted me to the continued existence of an underground water flow that starts north of here, runs through the old marble quarry site in Tuckahoe, goes under the school, and then goes out to the Bronx River. She also reminded me of the years of dumping at the old quarry site. There's been this terrific renaissance in Takahoe that I'm sure you've all seen in the past couple of years. So it's been really exciting to see the new restaurants, new businesses, and the investment there. Um, and this new construction also provides a great chance, an opportunity, to find out what's under the ground in these proposed construction sites. Rachel and her husband operate a karate studio on uh, Marbledale Road. Do you want to give the name? <laughs> Yeah, and that's on Marbledale. And she's been monitoring um, a site on Marbledale Road that's being proposed as a place for a new hotel. And her concerns about the environment and what would happen at this site led her to hire the environmental consultants and the attorney who are here with us tonight. When I heard about the issues, I contacted Vicki Ford, and she realized immediately that we should let other people in Bronxville um, know about this and get people up to date on what was happening. So that was why we organized this meeting. And I want to thank Paul Rubin, who's over here, Don Hughes, over there, oh, I'm sorry, over there, <laughs> I reversed <laughs> you, and David Gordon, who's up here in the front row. Um, if you look at the handout from the hall table, you'll see a printout. I hope, did everybody get one? Yes. Great. Okay. If you look at that, you'll see there's some key information. First, the developer applied for the Brownfield cleanup program. And that means he'll, you know, if it all goes through, he gets state reimbursement for toxic waste cleanup. Second, the developer's application recognizes a great deal of contamination both in the soil and in the groundwater. So we've got the, you know, not just the soil involved, but the water. And third, the site description states that the groundwater flow is presumed to be south, southwest towards the Bronx River. And I don't think anybody disputes that. Um, what hasn't happened is any testing to determine if toxics, toxins are being carried out from the old quarry site by the groundwater flow and there are contaminants in this water that can be released into the air by vapors. Did I get that right? Yes. OK, good. <laughs> I'm not the best person on the science part. Um, so we're not trying to cause a panic. We don't want anybody to get you know, frenzied or alarmed. But Vicki and I really wanted to be sure that the proper testing is done so that if there's a problem, it can be addressed properly. Um, so before the meeting ends, we hope that it'll be clear what we in Bronxville can do to make sure that our groundwater is tested and is safe. So that's enough for me. Um, we're going to hear from our experts and then have a question and answer period. Again, we're going to try to move things along so we can wrap up by 8.30. Um, we want to also have plenty of time for questions and answers. Um, we're asking people to write out their questions on the note cards that were passed out. Um, and it, we're not trying to censor anybody. We really want everybody's question to be answered. We just thought it would streamline the process, and we hope to not duplicate questions. And I think that does it for me. So um, Paul Rubin, the hydrogeologist, is 
going to speak first. He's been studying our rock formations and our water flow. Um, I didn't write up you know, detailed, a detailed intro. There's a little information on the agenda of his background. Um, but if you want more information about him, you can ask him or I'll get it for you. Okay, thanks. Yes, good evening. Uh, yes, I'm a hydrogeologist, which means I study groundwater flow beneath, beneath the ground and also surface water flow I, I look at as well. Tonight, I'm going to take a, a quick tour to show you what we do know about the groundwater flow, which all goes, you'll see ultimately, to, uh, to Bronxville. So here's a, a map of starting up in Tuckahoe, which we just talked about the development that's planned up here. The, the actual development site is this area in black. Okay, can everyone see that? This black outline. But yet it turns out that years ago when they were quarrying the inwood marble, they quarried in this cir circle here, ellipse, and in this one here as well to a depth of at least 85 feet. So the interesting thing about the planned brownfields development here is that it, any work that's done only addresses this black shape and none of the area here that were filled in with uh, all kinds of contaminants, which you'll hear about later tonight. We do know from site testing and wells that were put in on the site that the groundwater flow direction, at least locally on the site, is from north, north, northeast, down to the south, southwest, over in this direction here. To uh, give an idea of the area that we're concerned about down in Bronxville, here we are at the, the uh, Bronx River at the bottom end of the system. And this area in red indicates the area that drains, the watershed area, drains downslope to the Bronx River here. This purple line, I'm just pointing this out because it essentially goes from the Bronx River and Bronxville all the way through Tuckahoe and up to Scarsdale over here to the end of the, the watershed. We're going to take a look at the groundwater flow in the subsurface along that route. So this is just to, to point that out so when we see it, we know where we're looking. All right, first, uh, in order to determine where groundwater flow comes from. And our big concern here is, uh, are, is there, are there contaminants that might be moving from this uh, quarry waste site that might indeed be flowing underground and come out down in Bronxville in the river? So we need to look at that from a couple of angles. One key angle is where does the surface water drain based on the topography? This yellow area, all of this drains to the river down to here. But within this yellow watershed area, there's a, a ridge line right in here, which precludes a lot of the surface runoff from going uh, in that direction. Instead, it either goes in this direction or over to this direction. And ultimately, based on the slope of the land, it moves from the watershed area down into this area of the, the Bronx River. But how do we know, you know where that groundwater goes? And it turns out, without being really technical here, that we can figure this out pretty well. Their geologists through time have mapped the geologic units of rock that have been in the area. And one of the things they found is that this yellow band here and here, this is, this is what they quarried. This is the inwood marble. Okay, marble in geology is a very soft rock. It's easily dissolved as compared to other rocks that you might think of like a sandstone or in this case, we have a, a schist and nice type formations which are essentially impermeable rock units with a very permeable rock unit in the middle. So, oops. So this is really permeable. Water can move through this easily. It can't move through this impermeable rock to either side of a different color. And the slope is from this direction down toward this, this direction here. So it really, groundwater can't escape. It has to be confined within this yellow band. It can't go that way and it can't go that way. So it has to go from high direction here through the waste site here at the quarries down toward the Bronx River. So I mentioned that uh, marble is a particularly soluble kind of rock. And this is an example of limestone which behaves just like marble. And you can see in this example that uh, there are solution conduits. Water can actually move through these conduits or this is just a block of it. We can show how it easily dissolves, whereas the surrounding bedrock, it's not very soluble at all. So when we have limestone or a marble in the quarry here, we, and groundwater moves, it moves through two different ways. One are cracks or fractures in the rock where it moves really slow. 
and then it moves through these cave-like conduits, like the ones we see on the screen here, where groundwater can be rapid. Rapid means it can go sometimes up to kilometers per day. It can be very quick, depending on how open these conduits are. So this is important because in marble groundwater flow regimes where you have conduit development, uh, water can move fast, and contaminants can also move fast. And that's why cave bearing or karst, if you ever heard the term karst, karst aquifers are the most environmental, environmentally vulnerable aquifers anywhere. Because really, look at it, it's like an open pipe. Groundwater that moves in this conduit, it has no natural cleansing, so it can, what goes in goes out. So if they're of all organics, it can just move right on through as well. So uh, the, the flow component is either through fractures or partially through these conduits here. So uh, how do we know? Uh, are there really any conduits? It, you know, it sounds, we know there are caves and places, but are there any caves or conduits that can transport groundwater rapidly in our area? And the answer is yes. Here we see a couple of examples. Uh, here we have a stream that flows on the surface in the Hartsdale area, flows into, surface, into a sinkhole where it goes underground. Same is true here. Stream flows on the surface, hits that soluble marble, and disappears underground. So you can imagine easily that water that disappears into the ground doesn't just stop, it has to flow. So groundwater is moving from one direction to another. Think of the valley where the quarries are. What's one thing that's missing from that valley? Think about it. There's no surface stream. So groundwater is moving in the subsurface. And it turns out, although I've used this example here, that further to the, the north, in the same valley that you're within, there is a sinkhole that also takes water in as well. So these conduits are there. They're documented in literature by other geologists. The Inwood marble is known to be cave bearing. And cave bearing doesn't mean it has to be big enough for a person to go through to be a concern for contaminants. Really, it could be only as big as your finger because as soon as that groundwater moves from a very slow rate of flow as it might in fractures into an open conduit, whether it's finger size or three meters in diameter, it's rapid and, and very vulnerable. It can bring contaminants to some down gradient area. So let's take a look. I've, I put together a cross section to sort of mentally allow us to take a look at what's going on. And uh, this helps portray the situation right here. I've drawn that cross section. Here's the uh, Bronx River upslope to the south. And this is a surface topography going up through Tuckahoe, Bronxville, Tuckahoe, all the way up to Scarsdale. So the surface topography here has a, a great vertical exaggeration, just so that you can see it in, in cross section. And you have the distance in feet uh, along the x axis there. So what, what we do know, based on water levels in the landfill, is that the water level is not very far down. We know that there's a thin soil cover or in the landfill fill and debris elsewhere, soil, over, over top of this inwood marble. This is the, the quarry material and the soluble bedrock that's there. So groundwater is essentially moving uh, from upslope down to the Bronx River. Now, on the upslope area, we have a, a sinkhole right along the same inwood marble outcrop. So this is all part of the flow system. You're just, you just happen to be at the bottom end here. So you are the receivers or the receptors of any contaminants that are in these waste pits in Tuckahoe. These waste pits in the two quarries, we know this one goes to at least 85 feet deep. We don't know the depth in this one. And the testing that's been done have, has only been done within the confines of the proposed Brownfields development site. So we don't really know the full extent of the size of the debris or even all of its chemistry that Don will address soon. But we, know, we do know the groundwater moves, and it can move rapidly, and it can come up in a spring, such as uh, Grambleton Spring, which is very famous in the area. And some, at some point along the Bronx River, all these contaminants are moving. Now, the key thing here is groundwater is not stagnant. It definitely moves. It has a slope or a gradient. It moves from high ground to the low ground. It's confined to either side by non-soluble rocks. The only way this groundwater can go with this contaminant mass sitting up here perched above you is directly down through Bronxville and into uh, the river. And along the way, if they're evolved organics, some of these may rise up through fractures in the rock, as they did in Bowling Green, Kentucky, for example, and uh, cause evolved organic problems that 
should be considered. So we, we know a lot about the flow system, fractures, conduits, uh, and a rapid flow off-site, which has not been looked at at all. Looking down at the bottom end of the system in Bronxville, based on the geologic mapping that's done, we know that that inward marble that carries these contaminants has to come out based on the presence and absence of this marble somewhere in this area of the Bronx River. The school is not far up gradient up here. Uh, we have this spring that's been well documented since about 1866. This was a famous water source for this community until not that long ago. Uh, springs are uh, really quite telling. Maybe you've heard of Grammatin Springs. Very famous. Uh, and the thing is, in karst aquifers, that's where water comes out. It tends to come out at the bottom end of the system in a conduit. Sometimes it's big enough for people to actually go in with caving lamps and you know, explore. Sometimes, depending on how blocked up the spring is, sometimes it'll cause water to back flood in the system and go to what's called an overflow spring. That might be what this Grammatin spring was. It seems to be covered over, so we can't really take a good look at it right now. But it's important to know that people use this water for a long time. And a question I would ask is, uh, you know, what was the quality and why did they stop operation? So and to sum up everything here, we've looked at the situation. Groundwater flows from north to south from a high gradient, high slope area of the Marbledale Quarry waste site. Those contaminants move through the site and then down gradient of the site. And as long as a contaminant source remains in place, contaminants will migrate off site, there's no question. Covering the site with a brownfield building and a parking lot will do absolutely nothing to stop off site migration of contaminants. In fact, premature development would preclude contaminant source removal which is an important remedial option here. And we know that contaminant transport is occurring to the Bronx River. The uh, places where we need to monitor that offsite contaminant pulse or continued source that's moving through is probably down on the Bronx River at springs at locations that really haven't been determined yet. So again, as I mentioned before, this Grammatin Spring might be a key clue if we could find out where it is because we need to do offsite sampling. And in a, cave-like network here, we need to look at both the conduit portion and we need to look at the fractured bedrock portion, all of which the Brownsville program is not addressing. Thank you. Um, we'll now hear from Don Hughes, who's going to talk about okay, the so we need to environmental testing. Do a little technical transition and move the cable. You want to, do you want to put your computer up to the podium? How about that? Better. That's easier. Put your cable here, and I have your charger right here. Too. You can put that in. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Here's your charger. Go ahead. <clears throat> And here's your charger cable. Okay, all right. And this goes here. Okay, so my name is Don Hughes, and I'm a do consulting, environmental consulting, and I teach chemistry at a couple of campuses in um, in Syracuse. Lemoyne College and uh, SUNY Environmental Science and Forestry. And my students always get frustrated at me because I'm really bad at this computer geeky stuff. So let me see if I can, here we go, slide show. Okay, there we go. So Paul gave a wonderful introduction about um, the hydrogeology and I'm gonna talk about what's in the landfill, but I want to start out with a little overview of the history of the landfill. So it start out, as he mentioned, as a quarry. Uh, that went into sometime into, into the 1930s, and then it sat dormant until sometime early 1950s, 
And then it became a dump site. And so the owners of the dump site invited everybody in, of course, for a fee to bring their waste materials. And that continued into sometime in the 70s. And then it was used as an automobile repair facility and a storage area. Oops. So this is a series of aerial photos that shows the transition of the site. And you can see, so 1947, um, all the quarry holes are still open, uh, haven't been, uh, they're inactive at this point. They have filled up with water because due to the natural water table. You see by 1954, this northern section of, uh, of the quarry has been filled in. Uh, this one is off-site. It's really not part of our, uh, our issue. It's now a park, in fact. So I'm going to be referring to this quarry hole as the north hole and this one as the south hole. So it's been filled up on the north, and then by 1964, uh, the south one is still being filled in, but it's, it's on its way to being full. Paul showed you this map, um, so I just want to zero in on this section. So we have uh, the brownfield cleanup site, which is the black border. That's this. And then you see the north quarry hole extends far beyond it. It's only about maybe a quarter of it inside the site. And then there's a significant chunk of the south hole extending beyond the south property boundary. So what I want you to think about here is each one of these things is roughly 100 feet wide, 800 feet long, and on the order of 100 feet deep. We don't quite know how deep they are, but 85 feet has been confirmed in one location. Now this is a whole laundry list of suspected or known uh, origins of the waste materials. And we know that the East Chester Municipal Incinerator ash was dumped there and uh, much of these other things are suspected or documented to some limited degree. but. Um, well, I'm not going to read it, but you can see there's a lot of things. Um, the testing that's taken place recently in the last few years has corroborated this. We know that there's Freon on site. We know that there's cleaning chemicals on site. We know that there's metals, which could come from a number of these sources. Petroleum products, for sure, they're everywhere. Um, there's physical evidence of chunks of concrete and bricks and asphalt and all that kind of thing. There's petroleum odors. Um, anyway, solvents. You get the picture here. A lot of this has been found. All right, so this is the BCP site itself in detail. And let me just walk you through this. So I've drawn in here, there's the approximate boundaries of that south quarry hall. Here's the approximate boundary of the north quarry hall. And of course these both extend off site. We have these three businesses along Marbledale Road. Um, here's Rachel's Dojo here, there's a brewery here, there's a gymnasium here. The hotel that's being proposed is in this footprint. And we have a number of residences that are at a higher elevation, but very close to the landfill. This map shows, all these little points here show various kinds 
of sampling areas. So this one, for example, is a, a soil boring that goes into the subsurface. Uh, we've got some surface soil samples. We have monitoring wells in red. So there's a total of nine monitoring wells on site. And then we have these things called vapor, soil vapor points. So uh, this is something that's come at, the regulators have realized this is an issue in the last 10, 15 years that soil vapor becomes contaminated and then migrates into the insides of buildings and poses a health threat. So there's about 18 of those sampling points around. So what do we know about what's in the landfill? Well, all these things uh, have been seen and the con known contaminants, this is what's been found. And I'm going to walk you through uh, a number of these things. I'm going to focus on the groundwater because that's, that's what's moving off site. So this is, this is just an overview. This is all the kinds of testing that has taken place on the site. Um, notice that the subsurface, the deepest samples that have been taken, 37 feet. So from 37 feet down to 100 feet or whatever the bottom of this thing is, has not been chemically tested. They've had a few borings and in fact in the deep boring they found petroleum odors. So there's certainly strong evidence that there's petroleum down there. Uh, but that's not been chemically tested, unfortunately. So there's a lot we don't know about, not only off-site, we don't know anything about the off-site quarry holes, but we don't even know within the site in the deep soils. There's no testing. All right, so I apologize for not having had the time to graph this, but uh, the point of this slide is just to show you that in the soil we have a lot of metal contamination. And the comparison here is we've got our list of elements here. Um, and over in this column is what the DEC calls unrestricted use SCO. What that means is a soil cleanup objective. So what they've done is they've done some health risk analysis and ecological risk and come up with these numbers as indicators of what's an acceptable level of contamination in the soil. And then wherever there's an X, either for the surface or the subsurface, indicates that we have at least one, in most cases many, samples that are above those levels. So you see, for example, arsenic, we've got 13, highest level detected, 25. Um, I call your attention to lead, which is um, deemed safe at 63. We're up near 600 for lead. Mercury, quite a bit higher there. Uh, zinc, 5,500 highest levels uh, compared to an acceptable level of about 100. So we're well into the contaminated area. I'm just going to leave it with the metals. There's other contaminants as well in the soils. There's PAHs, um, PCBs, and uh, volatile organics. There's a whole laundry list. But I want to focus on the groundwater. Um, this just the, reinforces the point I was making before, which is to show you that as we get deeper into the landfill, we know less and less. So in this south quarry hole, 
in this top 12 feet, we have a fair number of analyses that have been done on the soil samples. We get to the next layer, it's fewer. We get down to 30 to 51 feet, we've only got three organics and two metals and PCBs, and then below that, there, there ain't nothing. We just don't know. So the two major pathways for things to get off site is either the soil vapors, which are volatile compounds that are emanating out of the site, and that's a particular concern if you live or work around the site. And then there is the groundwater water that Paul was referring to, and that's contaminated. We know it's contaminated, and it's certainly moving off site because groundwater moves, it just does. In fact, the, the groundwater testing that, uh, that the elevations show that there's very steep gradient on site and that has really yet to be explained. Okay, so that vapors can enter buildings is obviously supposed to be under soil vapors there. So here's a list of, that I've grouped together, metals, chlorinated solvents, PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls, which you probably know of from the Hudson River, some pesticides, PAHs, and phenol. And I'm just gonna walk you through uh, some of this. Uh, this is a little easier to deal with for the most part because I've created some graphs. So here's just one metal. This is antimony. It's, it's a, uh, not a carcinogen, but it is a health risk. I believe it has neurological implications. Standards have been set pretty low, three parts per billion. Obviously, we are far above that. Arsenic. A little higher standard for arsenic, 25, but you see we're in four of the wells. And you'll see this is a recurrent theme, these four wells, uh, which are on the southern part of the site, uh, frequently are far, far above uh, the metals limits. Now, I'm running out of space here, so I just crammed four of these guys into here, but you can see you get the, there's a recurrent theme here, right? Barium, chromium, cadmium, copper. Uh, I couldn't fit mercury. I couldn't fit um, zinc. But all well above the acceptable level in groundwater. Um, curiously, the developer's consultant did not test the groundwater for metals. The DEC had to go and do it. This one stands alone, lead. There's our acceptable limit. I have never seen lead levels this high in groundwater, ever. And I've worked on some pretty messed up sites, including Onondaga Lake and sites around it. This is pretty phenomenal. This information um, is going to be incorporated into the remedial investigation report only because I asked them to put it in and it's going to be stuck into an appendix. All right, next category is so chlorinated solvents. Oh, sure, I'm sorry. Yeah, so. Sure, I'm sorry. Yeah, so We've got two, two uh, contaminants in particular, which is trichloroethylene or ethene and tetrachloroethylene. Uh, these are degreasing solvents, frequently used in automotive, uh, in many, many industries. Uh, the one on oh, dry cleaners uh, used to use tetrachloroethene. 
And you can see the levels in these two wells, in particular MWA. These are both up in the northern section of the site, um, quite a bit above the water quality standard for groundwater. This one went up by a factor of about, well, more than three. Um, strangely enough, DEC doesn't seem to mind it a bit. These are vo both volatile compounds. They easily escape into the air. Both probable human carcinogens. Woburn, Massachusetts, these are the contaminants. PCBs. We also have PCBs in the groundwater above the standard. Not to the extent that the metals and the chlorinated compounds are, but still above the standards. There's a whole host of pesticides scattered around in the groundwater. There's two of them. These are <laughs> breakdown products of DDT. So they're relatives. They're both toxic. The standards that are set are quite low because these things accumulate in wildlife. And as you can see, we're well above those levels. And there's, there's a whole host of other pesticides, lindane, lindane's cousins, toxaphene, um, several others, endrin, dialdrin, many pesticides. Um, I can't explain where they're coming from, who put them there, but they're there. Okay, so PAHs, you may be less familiar with PAHs. Um, we call them that because they have that tongue-twisting name of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. They are multi-ring compounds. Many of them are carcinogenic, and they are found in coal. They are found in petroleum and all the der derivatives of petroleum. They are also formed in combustion, and so these PAHs are sprinkled throughout the urban environment because of driving cars and trucks and vehicles and all that. Um, so we have a lot of sources of, piece of uh, PAHs, potentially, incinerator ash, petroleum, buried coal, and they're in the groundwater, they are always in the groundwater. Every sampling round finds the PAH compounds in the groundwater and levels that are far, far above the acceptable ambient water quality standard. Some of these, some of these acceptable levels are quite low, and so you see we're many, many, like thousand times those. But even these ones with the higher limits, we're at them or approaching them. So PAHs, lots of them. And consistently and everywhere, I want to make that point, they are in every well. And then finally, phenol. Now, this is an odd thing that I came across. Um, I didn't pay much attention to this phenol until I saw this. And this is not highlighted in the report. But 100, 100 times the limit in this, in this well. What's going on there? Phenols. Um, may be related to uh, pharmaceuticals. It may be related to medical waste. Um, it could potentially have something to do with cleaning compounds.
So overall, there's many, many compounds. I have not addressed all of them. There's also gasoline type compounds, benzene, toluene, xylene, and um, ethyl benzene. That's a family. They're found in the groundwater. They're found in the soils. They're found in the soil vapors. I haven't talked about the soil vapors, uh, but they're certainly an issue. There's lots of, all the compounds I talked about are in the soil vapors. Um, high levels of Freon. So there was a refrigeration company uh, that happened to be right next door on Marbledale Road. Probably their equipment, old equipment or tanks are in there and they're leaking. There's active sources of Freon. There's no question in my mind that there's active leakage going on right now. Which makes me wonder, well, what else is in there? Are there drums of waste? Probably. Tanks. People have reported um, trucks and cars being buried there. We don't know. There's not been any kind of um, testing that would ascertain that. You'd need to either dig trenches or do a magnetometer kind of survey or ground penetrating radar. But it would be nice to have that work done. So we have uh, a lot of chemicals, a lot of potential health problems. We've got contamination in the groundwater, as Paul explained, that is certainly moving south. And we have contaminated soil vapors. Thank you. Thank you.